Have you ever wondered how your mind can shape your biology? Can changing our thoughts and behaviors actually modify our genes? How can mindfulness practices like meditation help us creating a profound shift in well-being when integrated into our daily life? Are you ready to unlock the secrets of your genetic potential? Join me after the intro for a conversation with a very special friend with whom we will answer these and many more questions. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Rosanna D, and this is Forgiven Tribe, a podcast where we explore what thriving in life means and how we can achieve it, irrespective of our past, current condition, and expectations that those around us or society in general may have. Let's go. Welcome to the Forgiven Tribe Show. We have often talked about the impact that our behaviors and choices can have on our health, the so-called lifestyle diseases, our relationships, and our careers. However, a relatively new science of the broader field of genetics called epigenetics is challenging this concept, revealing that our choices and experiences can have a much more profound impact on our lives by shaping our biology beyond the fixed genetic code we inherit. Epigenetics introduces us to a paradigm shifting concept that our DNA is not our destiny. Beyond the fixed blueprint of our genetic code lies a dynamic landscape where external factors can influence gene expression, determining our cellular function and perhaps even inherited traits. So today we unravel the profound connection between our inner world and our biological makeup as we discover how the choices we make and the experiences we undergo can have a lasting impact on our genes, health, and overall well-being. We learn how we can harness this to achieve greatness in our lives, delve into the transformative power of mindfulness practices like meditation, and explore if and how this ancient practice can help us shaping the very structure and function of our brains. And we dive into this fascinating topic in a conversation with today's guest, Lisa Marie. Lisa is a mindfulness mentor, holistic specialist, coach, and speaker. After running away from home and a mother with a violent psychiatric illness in her teens, Lisa joined the military, from which she was discharged after serious injury left her disabled. 18 surgeries later, and after an abusive husband, left her uh, facing bankruptcy, she went on to become a medical scientist, then a successful entrepreneur, PD and leadership speaker, and for the past 20 years, she has been a holistic health practitioner. Today, she combines her immense experience with her knowledge of meditation, neuroscience, and epigenetics to help people rewrite their subconscious limiting internal patterns to achieve greatness and become unstoppable in life and business no matter how challenging their past was. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the Forgive and Try Show. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Oh, my gosh, Rosanna. That was just so beautifully said. I've got goosebumps, and I'm I'm so honoured that <laughs> that was my, my opening. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, you are very much welcome, and I... I'm really fascinated about science. I mean, I'm a scientist by education, but everything that is scientific really triggers my uh, my mind and, and, and my brain. So I, I'm really excited to, to talk about something that, to be honest, I didn't discover until I started preparing for this episode. So I okay. didn't know much about it. And yeah. I would argue that perhaps a lot of people also um, ignore right. these kind of things. So I, I'm really excited to bring this topic into the uh, into the mix, into the conversation. But before going into that, I really would like to start with you. I mentioned just a, a few things, highlights from from your life. But I, I probably I have the the feeling that your life has been quite challenging and shaped probably the person you are today and the person that today helps others achieve greatness. Yes. Can we start from there? Yes, yes, goodness gracious. 
Um, I I often say I've lived many lives in one because <laughs> there's there's a there's a big backstory. Um, but I, I guess really, especially with the way you've just opened this beautiful show, is um, we've got our DNA, and then we've got the suitcase of experiences that has really created who we are. And my very first memory, I believe, is what was the beginning of a very challenging, I, I've got to say it would have been a very challenging first 40 years because I've, I've undone lots of layers over those years. I'm in my 50s now. But when I was four years old, this is the earliest memory I have. I was, my sister and I, she was a little bit older than me. We were called into my parents' bedroom and my dad was sitting on the end of the bed crying and he had a single suitcase next to him. And he said to my sister and I, he said, um, I love you, but I can't stay here anymore and I have to leave. And that was basically it. He got up and walked to the bus stop with his suitcase. And I don't remember what happened at that point in time within me, but all I can imagine that a four-year-old child would be thinking is, why have I been such a bad child that you don't love me anymore? Is that why you're leaving? And, you know, no amount of explaining to a four-year-old can help them understand <laughs> why your parents have split up. But uh, my mother did have very violent psychiatric illness. And um, I, I imagine the fear was just because we were left with her. The next timeline event for me was when I was about six. And this is a bit of a funny story. So I've always lived with optimism. And I think this is very important because it's probably been one of my tools in my survival kit. You know how at, at school carnivals you have the, the track and field carnivals, you've got the swimming carnivals. Well, I went along to the swimming carnival and threw myself in the Olympic size pool and started to sink halfway. <laughs> and I, I actually got pulled out of the water but I decided I wanted to be a swimmer at that point. I thought, hey, let's go to squad so I can learn how to swim. And that was actually a blessing in disguise because the club that I went to, uh, it was a very high caliber club and we had national champions, world champions and an Olympian at that squad. And for me, it was twofold. I was actually surrounded by champions. I was surrounded by people with a, a, a strong champion mindset who believed that they could achieve anything. And also it kept me out of the house for five hours a day. I trained two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half hours in the Avo. And, you know, you've got your six hours at school. So 11 hours of the day, I did not have to be in that horror house. And my mother was actually in and out of psychiatric hospitals while I was growing up. So that was the severity of it. There was always law enforcement involved. And back in the day, you know, back in the 70s, um, there, there really wasn't child protection. There wasn't the awareness of safe houses for children uh, in extreme risk. And, you know, what I, I started to pour all my energy into the swimming and I thought, well, if I become a champion, I might be able to win my mother's love. And it's a funny thing, Rosanna, one of the six human needs is significance. And that was my way of if I become really significant, then I might be able to earn her love. But, I mean, that doesn't work in somebody who hasn't got a, a, a reality. And uh, I became a very powerful swimmer. I was, uh, I, I rose to the, the level of a national champion in, in my uh, favoured stroke. Because I was so good at what I was doing, it became my mother's obsession and so that then became very, very toxic. And so I started to hate it. And this is also really important for the listeners. Once you really start to hate something that you're no longer in alignment with it, things go wrong with your health or the situation. Um, you could, you know, I, I've, I've worked with people trying to lose weight and get healthy for many, many years. And as soon as they start a new program, they'll either catch a cold or if they're trying to get fit, they'll twist their ankle. You know, something happens to them. I started to get recurrent ear infections, which took me out of the pool. 
to the point where I hated it so much that I stopped swimming. So the next timeline was when I was 14 and I was invited to go along to a martial arts club, but it was actually a metaphysical club. And what that meant was metaphysics is beyond our 3D existence. And we learnt meditation, Tai Chi. So we're going back with the arts of over 3,000 years. And we learned how to channel that internal energy, which is called chi in the Eastern arts, and use it. But also it was really going within yourself and learning different levels of how you can actually master your mind. And I'm a 14-year-old. So from the age of six, I was exposed to champions. Um, the age of 14, I, I get thrown into the world of 3,000 years ago. <laughs> And I felt really at home there. Meditation for me and doing Tai Chi and I could feel the energy flowing. And I'd obviously developed courage and resilience by this stage. And uh, I I've got to ask you a question, Rosanna. When you were a teenage girl, did you really start to fight for your dominance in the world and uh, express yourself and, and just be you and, and think you know everything as a teenager? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting question because uh, my teens were a little bit different from the, the majority of, of the, the friends I had. Um, at the time, my father was, uh, was sick. He had cancer. So it was a, a different, very different sort of atmosphere growing up. And uh, there, there were problems that were definitely bigger than, than me. Yes. And... Yes. Uh, so my, my dad spent many, many months in, in hospital and um, yeah. it, it was just over four years uh, from the time we discovered to the time when unfortunately he passed. And it, it became very serious uh, almost straight away. So yeah. because of, of the time he spent in hospital and my mom had to be with him, uh, caring for him, I spend a lot of time at home with my sister, who is uh, four, four years younger than me. So yes. we we had to to be adults. Uh, yes. I was fifteen when we found out my sister was eleven. So I, I think I, I never developed that that moment when you really start growing up and, and you have this uh, attitude. But I could see that in in many of my my friends that yeah. didn't the same level of uh, problems at home that I'm yes. experiencing. Yes. And I can see with my oh, well, nephew, you. with my nephews as well, um, the, the eldest is uh, uh, almost 16 now and and the, the middle one is uh, 12 and a half and they start, you know, growing up with, with that attitude. It's the hormone fluctuations. <laughs> exactly. they, they, they know best, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm so sorry to hear that, and uh, I, I certainly understand of of that part of your childhood being removed because I sort of was a kid, and then I was surviving, you know. So uh, I, I really don't remember much of my childhood. There's this just these timeline events that is pretty much all I remember, which is a great safety mechanism of the brain. However. It can also be a disadvantage because you don't work through the grief and the sadness and the anger um, possibly as fast as what you could if those memories were in the forefront. But, uh, you know, it is what it is and, and I always believe life is always happening for you at the time it does for a particular reason. I started to really believe that one day I will get out of that place and that because I saw my friends lived a very different life. And literally from the age of four, I lived every day in fear, literally unpredictable fear. You never know, never knew when the, the next snap was going to come and it could have been multiple a day. Uh, my mother did actually remarry probably when I was about 10 to a Vietnam veteran and he had his own bag of PTSD. He was an alcoholic. So, you know, it was a pretty wild cocktail of neglect. <laughs> but because I was starting to become very strong, both physically and mentally, to my mother, that was actually a threat. She was dominate and control or destroy. That was literally the way she operated. Got to the point where 
because I was really trying to, I was very introverted, but I was strong willed. So when I wanted to do something, I would, I would try and find a way to do it. Um, but that was not acceptable to her as well. Uh, we were not allowed to be a person. We weren't allowed to think for ourselves. We weren't. So, you know, there were, we were literally powerless. And it got to the point where she was starting to feel so threatened by me because she saw the strength in me that she told me that she was going to kill me while I was sleeping. And, of course, uh, I was 15. I don't think I was 16 at that point in time. And I just thought, I've got to get out of here. And so that's when I ran away. It, this is very interesting. People who are not in control find a way to be in control and it's normally some kind of self-harm. My sister started to hurt herself and for me, I actually decided to stop eating. My brain and hormones were so messed up. I, you know, I, um, I looked at myself, I was unhappy and I thought I was fat even though I wasn't. And I developed anorexia nervosa to the point of being hospitalized. That was after I ran away. Um, I just became so weak. But I was about 42 kilos, which is about 110 pounds, 105 pounds or something. And at that point as well, I was just feeling so not desperate, but how do I move forward? How can I escape this crazy get my life back? How do I live my life? When I ran away, I was gone for a few weeks until the police took me back home. But while I was away, I actually felt safe. There was actually almost like a calm because I wasn't on edge the whole time. I was just in such a dark place. At that point, I actually contemplated suicide. And that little inner voice that I'd always listened to, it just said to me, Lisa, you're not escaping yourself you're escaping her. You've got so much to live for and you're going to find a way. You're going to find a way out. And went back home. I finished year 12. On the day before my 18th birthday, I joined the army. That's my ticket out of here. And it was great. It was, for me, freedom because even though it was disciplined and you had people yelling at you and all this kind of stuff, like it was a walk in the park compared to what I grew up in. Unfortunately, 18 months into that, I ended up having quite a serious accident that left, it smashed my pelvis and left me lower limb disabled. So I couldn't walk without crutches and a walking stick. And from the age of 19, I had developed systemic endometriosis. So my hormones were very unbalanced. And that was from the age of 19 to 29, I'd had abdominal surgery 14 times to remove disease. I was on all sorts of horrific hormone therapy that literally threw me into menopause as a 20-year-old to try and stop the disease. And, uh, you know, I had this, this pelvis injury as well. And when we actually relate that back to our energy centers in our body, when we're talking about the chakra system, which is Eastern practice, the lower three levels are your survival levels. And that is where all of my disease and injury was. Interesting fact that when you have blockages within, if you do understand the Eastern philosophies, you can actually almost pinpoint an area in your body where you've got disease or injury. It's a fascinating thing. I was medically discharged from the army. I just thought, well, I, I want to keep striving. I want to keep moving forward. That was the only way I knew. That was my survival mechanism. So I went to university. I became a medical scientist. I was all, always fascinated by science. I was always curious. One of my beautiful mentors, Mr. Jim Rohn, would always say, ask quality questions and you'll get quality answers. And so I've always said, why is this so? Because being curious is how we learn and grow and how we find solutions to sometimes what seem to be impossible problems. So there's been a couple of bad marriages in there. Um, I worked really hard as a medical scientist and got myself a couple of investment properties. And husband number two wanted to buy a small business. And the banks suggested, why don't Lisa, you use those as guarantor for his small business. Well, the business went broke in 20 months. He walked away with no debt, 
and his home and I walked away with a suitcase and a $500,000 debt facing bankruptcy. Right. There's only one way up from here and it's up. As I always do, I ask the universe for help. Help me, please. Just show me a way. I know there's a solution out there for my health. And uh, it's amazing, Rosanna. When you ask for help, you're actually sending out like a an SOS telegram to the universe and uh, something's going to catch it for you <laughs> and send a message back. And I was introduced to... Um, a range of wellness products that for me had life-changing health results. And because I was working in medical science, I was in diagnostic pathology, I worked with oncology, Rosanna. So I, I was in bone marrow transplant, stem cell, stem cell transplant. So, you know, I was really surrounded by people who had a terminal prognosis. I saw that as a bit of a gift for me because I was so sick. I was living in so much pain. I was so sad. And it it was like contrast for me because I wasn't that patient in that bed. I was still in a better position than what they were. And so I always looked on the bright side of things. I always was grateful for what I had, but I was certainly eager for more. And that step out of the sickness industry into the wellness industry, I said to myself, I want to be in prevention. I want to transform lives. I just don't want to transform their health. I want to take it the whole mind, body, soul journey because you can't just fix the exterior environment and exterior circumstances. You've got to literally change within. So, during that process as well, the last 20 years, I've been involved in very high level personal development and high performance leadership. So that was, that was not only what I could teach, but it could also be part of my healing journey, uh, along with a lot of the Eastern modalities that I've used to heal my life, heal my soul, allow me to step into the true me and have a purpose much higher than me, much bigger than me. Wow, wow. I mean, I'm really sorry to hear all the struggles that you had at the beginning of, of your life. Um, but as, as you said earlier, and uh, I always uh, uh, say as well, things happen for a reason and yeah. they happen for us. And very often when we look back, we just discover that they are just blessing in disguise yes. and, and and so many uh things that happen to you allow you today to help others and yes. so th this is absolutely beautiful so i would like really to understand more about epigenetics and yes. understand what it is in simple terms what it can do for us and uh, for sure we can, we can exploit that Yes, yes. And the exciting thing is we have learnt more in the last 10 years. I'll keep it really simple. You know, if you've suspected to break a bone, you go and get an x-ray where they can see your skeleton, your bone. And then if you need to do a CAT scan of your organs, they put a dye in you and they can actually see different parts of your organs. MRI does muscle imaging and soft tissue imaging. So we have incredible technology we can image um the brain the em energy of the brain so dr bruce lipton is sort of like the the father of epigenetics and he it's basically understanding the frequency of our biology meaning um i'm going to use a great example if i picked up my mobile phone now and i had your phone number rosanna I could call you and the frequency of my digital number to your digital number would bounce off satellites all over the world and they would meet because it's a matching frequency. And inside of our body, all of our cells, so my job as a scientist was to look down a microscope and we can see under large magnification, we can see cells. We actually go down many, 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 many gazillions more magnification and we can see the, the micro and nanostructures of cells. 
And at the end, end of all that micro magnification is just literally vibrating energy. The human body is a mass of vibrating energy made up of trillions of cells with their own little packet of information to be an ear or an eye <laughs> or, a, <laughs> or a leg or something. We know that the body emits a certain electromagnetic frequency. The heart space has 100,000 times more electromagnetic frequency emitted than what our brain does. And all of our organs, they actually have their own brain. Our heart just does what it does. We don't have to tell it what to do, thank goodness, because it beats 33 million times a year. <laughs> um, our brain it does all of these amazing things all by itself. And so we have such incredible technology in our body that um, all emits a frequency. And we know through the studies through Dr. Bruce Lipton and, you know, there are a few key people, uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, they like it. They're the brain people, um, uh, can measure the frequency of the brain that in different stages of emotion, um, as soon as we have a thought, what happens is we have a massive release of chemicals down our nervous system. It's like instant, like a lightning bolt. And from that moment, we have a hormone reaction because it's being given a signal. And then there's this cascade of reactions that go on to have us have a feeling and then possibly an action. It could be fight and flight. It could be digesting our food. It could be all these things. When we live in a very low emotion of shame, guilt, fear, anger, grief, sadness, anxiety, what happens is these are the hormones of stress. And we're only meant to be in the hormones of stress in a fight and flight situation. But unfortunately, because of 21st century living, that is actually hard turned on. People are now in a heightened state of stress almost 24-7. Example, a lion hunting a deer in the African plains. All of a sudden, the deer sees the, a lion or smells it and it takes off. Like they could have the chase for three or four minutes, outruns the lion. The deer goes back to grazing as though nothing's happened. And so it goes back to a normal state of balance of hemostasis where its system comes back into normal regulation. Modern life with all of the shiny things that we're exposed to, all of the horrible fakeness of social media, all of the pressures of family, all of the media everything that's coming in we have 70 thoughts a day going through our brain and 95 percent of that is actually the redundant replay of the monkey mind chatter that we spoke to ourselves about yesterday and the day before and the day before all the things we're unhappy about all the things that aren't good enough all the things that we should have done over and over and over again and this is keeping us in this heightened state of the survival hormones and so where cortisol burnout, baby, dopamine burnout, where our body gets addicted to the hormones of stress. Can I ask a question? Do you drink coffee, Rosanna? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I'm a bit addicted. <laughs> I okay. mean, that's my justification, but no, I'm actually addicted to coffee. I'm going to give a great, easy example to understand epigenetics. So... If you drink more than the average of one to two cups a day of normal coffee, you, your little cells create, I call them parking bays. So it creates a parking bay for caffeine. And if those parking bays aren't filled on time, what happens is you get a brain message saying, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm, I, I need my coffee. Um, and that's all you can think about is I need to get my coffee. And that is literally the, it's almost like a lock and key that finally the caffeine's come and, be, and it's inserted into the lock. And therefore the, the brain, the cell goes, ah, oh, thanks for that. And so that 
state, and this happens with medication, this happens with smoking, this happens with drinking alcohol, this happens with the people who have too much fast food in their diet with all of the chemicals and the, the fats and the sugars. We have all these different parking bays on our cells. We've got over 100 trillion cells in our body. Can you imagine the storm going on when you don't fulfill those parking bays where you are all body? You are no energy, you are no mind, you are all body and your body is running your mind. And so the hormones of stress also create parking bays on our cells. They epigenetically change. So the core structure, the core little DNA recipe that you were born with from mum and dad still stays the same. I mean, we can have mutations, which happens occasionally, um, but the expression, like the, the recipe on the outside of the cell that has formed with all of the things that you're putting into it, mind and body, like the environment, the pollution, the social media, the media, the Netflix, <laughs> um, the coffee, the, the alcohol, all those things now have a signal on the outside of your cell that your body expects every single day. It becomes addicted to that. And so when you don't have that, um, you know your body is putting up a protest and then your mind becomes obsessed with it because it just needs to get that fix. And this is also with the hormones of stress. We become so turned on with those that when the perfect example is, especially in people living in a toxic relationship, that there might be a couple of days where nothing bad happens and then all of a sudden a snide remark might happen and then you snap back and then all of a sudden, you know, the toing and froing is on um, or, you know, your your child does something that triggers you because you're, you're tired and grumpy or whatever, you've had a bad day at work and then all of a sudden you get this big whoosh of hormones, the ones that your body wanted all over again. So like I said way back early in our conversation is that when your body starts to protest about, when, you're, when you don't want to do something anymore, your body, it lets you know. This is also almost the opposite. When your body is addicted in this low negative vibrational state, and you don't have a crisis for a day or two, you will make something happen. Like it will be the law of attraction that something happens for it to be set off again. And this is why it's so difficult for people to change. Can you understand that when we are not in control literally of our body because it is so flooded with these hormones constantly that to be able to change our, if we want to lose weight, to change our habits there, if we want to get fit, to change our habits there because the brain brain is used to it. The brain is used to operating at that level and as soon as the brain frequency changes, it actually pulls out a safety net and says, hey, this isn't normal. What are you trying to do? You know you've been on several diets and they didn't work. Why are you going to try this again? You know you're going to be hungry in two hours. Ah. Uh, you know what your husband's going to say, don't you? And, you know, all of this stuff. And then, of course, you go back to exactly how you were because it's more comfortable being in this low negative vibrational state because you you and your, bra your body and your brain is used to it than to actually move into the discomfort zone. But it's in that uncomfortable zone, which is where the change has to happen. And so trying to bookend this all to keep it really simple. It is now well known in, you know, I'll bring modern health and wellness back into it because quantum science, what people think is wild woo-woo <laughs> is actually just the Eastern arts that have been around for 3,000 years and we have forgotten how to use our innate power, our own natural abilities to tap into that greatness. And so 
to to be able to change your health, your relationships, your finance, your emotional status, literally reinvent your life, there is a whole process, like it's a sequential stacking process of learning how to do the basics to start with, with good health and wellness and, um, you know, learning some techniques in <laughs> tapping out when the relationships go on pear-shaped <laughs> or yelling at the kids or whatever it might be or bad spending habits because you're used to just spending everything that you've got and left with nothing again, you know, that constant state of scarcity and lack of mindset, lack, lack mindset. But going within People think meditation is weird if they've never tried it before. And, yes, of course it's weird because you've never tried it before. And people fear what they don't know. And the hardest thing is trying to become still because that 70,000 thoughts a day is going to start talking at you when you're trying to be quiet. (laughs) And so the easiest way to actually start to learn to be present, I'm sure – Many people have heard of The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. You know, it's a uh, it's a very famous best-selling book. Um, but he just talks about being present. And all mindfulness is about being present, being present when you eat, chewing your food, tasting the flavours, smelling the beautiful food, um, being present, listening to Mother Nature, listening to the birds, listening to whatever. So mindfulness is just being present. But to... A great way to start to learn to meditate. And you don't have to sit in the lotus position chanting om. (laughs) You're not a monk, okay? You don't need to do that. But it's just sitting in a relaxed position. It's very important to sit upright because we actually want to oxygenate our lungs because that's really important for your brain. Um, and, uh, And sit tall because our energy centers, our seven main energy centers, the eastern chakra system is running along our spine from our where we sit uh, up to the crown of our head and we want the energy to flow through there. Most people are so exhausted that if you were to lay down and focus on your breathing, you'd probably be asleep in two minutes and we, <laughs> we want you to learn some, some alert mindfulness. And so just focusing on the in-breath, it could be counting for four, and then out-breath, in-breath through your nose, out-breath through your mouth. Just something really basic and beautiful like that. And that can alone bring you down into a state of relaxation because what it does, it actually, it's a signal to your nervous system to relax. It turns the the survival system off uh, momentarily. So the key, like there's a, a process of guided meditation of allowing you to still be conscious in your conscious brain waves, which is only 5% of our, our brain's capacity of, of consciousness. And the rest of it, that 95% is our subconscious pattern. This is the pattern we've been running on our entire life. Your subconscious is programmed from the age of in utero to about 35. All of the signaling started while your mum was cooking you. Okay, while you were in her belly, you got everything that she did. If it was traumatic and stressful, that is part of your epigenetic makeup. If it was beautiful, peaceful, love and and harmony, and that is part of your epigenetic makeup. And and so we can change like the from a cellular perspective, the body can actually totally regrow a new cell generation in 90 days. So people have got to hang on for 90 days and be consistent. Um, and uh, all, all my message is, is planting the seeds of hope. You can change. You can't undo the trauma and the impact that it's had on your life, but you can actually heal from trauma and step into your absolute greatness. And I say awaken that giant within totally reinvent yourself and become the true person, that person, that higher self that has always been you. You just haven't let it out of the box, but it's in there. Wow. I mean, this is so interesting. And as you said, it's uh, really a message of hope because 
there are so many issues from addiction. I was listening to a documentary about losing weight. There is a, a new medicine that is similar to the one that diabetic people take. And there is a, a lot of criticism from some people saying, oh, you know, this is for diabetics. And if you are not, you are just uh, overweight. You shouldn't really be using but I was reading what this medication actually does, and it's really working on the uh, nerve system to remove that need for the uh, the food yeah. and, and the addiction, which seems to go in the same direction that that you mentioned, and the difficulty really of stopping something that we have been doing for a very long time. So there is hope in there, and I like the fact that without medications, we can use these uh, very ancient practices like uh, yes. um, meditation and uh, breath work uh, as well to, to achieve the same, the same result. So I, I, I absolutely love that. May I ask you about children? Because yes. we started with your experience uh, as a child, as a teenager, and all the challenges that, that you had. How can we help our children to be strong, to understand that their genetics can be modified, that they are in power and they can yes. change and they don't have to resign to whatever habits? I mean, if I think of children and, and teenagers, I, I think about social media, I think about all, uh, all games that are designed to create addiction. Yeah, and exactly. and it's, it's very difficult to talk with them out of those addictions. So yeah. how can we talk to them in a way and explain that they can and they are in power? Yeah, and I mean, there's gosh, there's so many pieces to that jigsaw puzzle. And when I've worked with adults in my wellness career, I've always said, I, I want you to think about being a role model for your children because kids copy. Kids copy everything from that's how they learn. If we are eating healthy food, having an active lifestyle, have outdoor fun and games or indoor fun and games, depending on your weather, that wellness lifestyle, first of all, is paramount. Definitely always have home prepare meals and, and limit the amount of purchased food like processed food that they are exposed to like the marketing is designed at the kids not the the adults and you know when johnny says i want i want i want a, a thousand times mum's eventually going to give up because the toy is what they think they're getting but they got to eat the junk food to get the toy and so you know thinking about those but explaining the kids having a hysterectomy at 29 i never had children when I, my partner came into my life, he, he came with two babies. <laughs> Mother Nature fixed that up for me. Uh, so I was going to be a mum whether or not I wanted or not. And the biggest blessing in disguise with that was that I got to learn what a child's life with love and safety was like because I was the parent role doing that like it was really foreign to me and I was still very disconnected but they got nurtured they got loved and so I learned a lot during that process but what I did is all I had to do was flip everything that I was exposed to the a complete opposite way we allowed our children even from young age to express their feelings we wanted to hear how they were feeling because often we're telling kids what we think based on our belief system. But that's a complete, unique, amazing human that has their own inner being that they're going to grow up and their belief system might not actually be the same as yours. And that's okay. And so to hear your children, to make space for having family time, to even discuss what might be going on in the family, what the parents are planning ahead, and, you know, to, to have it an interactive, not to tell the kids all the, the nitty gritty stuff like that, but it's important, one, to listen to your children because they'll, they'll be telling you stuff that you didn't even know they were thinking about. And half the time we don't get to that point. 
um, to definitely help explain the pros and cons of screen time and the dangers of social media. You know, it's about equipping them. And all we can do is equip them as best we can. We can't control them. They're going to evolve into the person they're going to evolve. And if we keep putting the brakes on all that as well and try and protect them from everything, I think that can have an adverse effect. And I'm not saying let them go and be experimental and try everything. That's definitely not what I'm saying here. Um, but if we actually step out of our parenting role and be a friend, a mentor, a guide, a listener, an active listener, so much better than what we do as parents because we're always tired, we're always busy. Like our life was very different. So, you know, our kids are adults now. Um, we were tough. We were strict with our kids, but we gave them space. We gave them voice. And we told them right from the beginning, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. If you don't want to go to university, that's okay. We said, you've got to finish high school because a young kid can't decide what they're going to do for the rest of their life when they're a teenager. They <laughs> Like, are you in your chosen career still, Rosanna, or when uh, you left school? Well, uh, funny enough, I, I am to some extent, but I'm also shifting now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but most people, like our generation's a little bit different um, because it was like you go to college, you get your career and you're there yeah. until you retire. And I, I guess we now know that life is very different because there's so many opportunities. You can literally start a blue water business today and and have it be a global brand next year because we're so creative. And that's a beautiful thing is what I'm trying to say is allow our children to be creative. Find out who they are, like really who they are, what they want. A lot of kids don't talk because they're frightened of what their parents might, t uh, might think of them of what their th their feelings are inside. And so we were always very worldly with our children to just be honest with them. And uh, when I say not keep anything from them, I mean, we were still guarded. Of course, we, we were res respectful, <laughs> responsible parents, but we, we didn't, we didn't have expectations that when they grow up, they're going to do this, this, and this, it's the ideal world. And that, that just isn't reality. But I think if we practice being a role model, we have an ideal of how we want our children to grow up. And I say, take a look in the mirror before you start casting that belief system on your child. Make sure that you are representing the, the, the high level that you want them to grow up into. That's really, really important. It's, it's servant leadership. It's lead by example. You lead by example and they will follow anyway because you will be a role model for them. Absolutely agree on this. And in fact, on this particular topic, I would like to go into the forgiveness concept and in particular self-forgiveness for everybody that has tried and tried and tried perhaps overcoming whatever addiction they were in. And perhaps after this episode, they start to understand why it was so difficult and why they didn't succeed on that. And, and the role of perhaps compassion as well and self-compassion or whatever it was and, and give themselves the permission to, to move forward and, uh, and say, you know, yes. uh, whatever it was the past it was, I cannot change that, but there is hope for the future and I can thrive again. So yes. what Oh, my <laughs> gosh. You are a wordsmith. This is so beautiful. And I'm so glad that you brought this up because I think this is such a, a beautiful way to, to end what's been, you know, initially the sharing my story from the beginning was um, there was no there was no forgiveness or compassion in my bones <laughs> for a very long time. I didn't understand it. I was my emotions were so shut off uh, and I was such a hard driven person that if people want to achieve something, I just said, well, do it. Stop making excuses. I, you know, look at everything I've had to face and just do it. So I was not compassionate at all because it was survival. I had to do it. And so my brain didn't understand that if people wanted something, why they just didn't do it. 
mind you, I wasn't a nasty person. I was just emotionless. Mm -hmm. And you know why, Rosanna? It's because my heart was locked closed. That four-year-old, that day she shut the door so she didn't have hurt come in and just protected herself so much. But this is uh, really the the day that changed my life. It was 2012 and I was in a leadership development conference in Singapore. There were two little husband and wife Korean speakers on stage. It was all through translation. They were so beautiful. The love just oozed out of them on stage and you could almost feel it. It was palpable. And like I'd gone through lots of development and, and releasing a lot of stuff because I was 40. And, and so obviously I'd let a lot of stuff go. But clearly because I was, there were patterns that I kept getting trapped back into and that really annoyed the heck out of me. And, and I knew that that was unresolved issues. And so they had a picture of a big blue door up on the screen, like the big auditoriums, there's giant screens and there was a blue door. And in Buddhism, the blue door is the doorway to joy and happiness. And they had a different slant on it. They said, is your door opened or closed? And they said, the blue door is actually the doorway to your heart. And I just had this crushing pain on my chest at that moment because you know, it was immersion style training. Like we were, we were in the room. We'd already been in the room for four or five hours and I just burst out crying and it was really uncontrollable sobbing. And I just thought all these years, for 40 years, I've had my heart locked closed and through all the pain, all the trauma, all the abuse, you, when your heart's closed, you're trying to protect yourself. But the worst part is, is that you can't lo let love in and you certainly don't love yourself. And at that moment, I just realized I've been angry, like really, really angry all of these years. And I really mustn't have loved myself to be driving myself so hard because, Rosanna, I was very successful, but I was unfulfilled. Nothing was ever good enough. And that is a huge, huge recipe for misery. And I was miserable and at that moment, I just felt this big release, like it was it was a, a physical let go, as though my heart door just went woof. And it was amazing because the heart chakra is the bridge. You've got your lower three survivals, you've got your beautiful heart space in the middle, and that is the bridge to your infinite essence and spiritual greatness where energy can flow. And my life went on this trajectory of learning. I had to forgive my mother. And so I went through multiple forgiveness processes about her, with her, and about how I treated myself as well. I had to forgive myself for the crap life that I dealt myself and all the things that I, I did and didn't do. And I just learned at that same time is that I had to be compassionate. I had to understand everyone is suffering in their own way and to be kind and compassion and show people what they need to do, give them unconditional love. And I am a no judgment girl. Like I, I've not judged people for many decades because my mother judged everybody and it was so ugly and, and just live with unconditional love, forgiveness, and compassion with everybody. And I feel that for everybody because I know everybody is suffering in their own way. And when you unlock the doors to all of the, the, the pains and the traumas that you haven't let go of yet, when you open those doors, you actually set yourself free and your life will change beyond a realm that you couldn't even imagine. Amen. I absolutely love that. Uh, fantastic. Lisa, I'm aware of time, so I would like to come back on you before concluding this fantastic conversation. And I would like to know what you are doing right now, if there is anything that you want to share with us, what you are planning for, 
anything? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm building an app. <laughs> That's exciting. So hopefully that'll be ready in about 90 days. Um, and it's all about mindfulness habits. I have um, a few social platforms. Everything can be found on my website, which is my name, lisamarie.com. Um, it's M A W R W E. There's two R's and two E's. It's very tricky. I have a 28 day. It's basically reinventing your body, where it's really about nutrition, uh, fitness, and mindset to help people get into a healthy lifestyle habit. I have a specific morning routine that I've been doing for 20 years, and I also have a guided session with people if they want to uh, tailor that to their own personal lifestyle. And, uh, you know, you'll hear many success thought leaders around the world that always talk about their morning routine. And um, I fill my cup up first in the morning before I even look at it's three hours from when I wake up to when I touch my phone. I serve me first so I can then serve the world. And I have a 90 day course where it's literally um, the whole transforming your life and we work through uh, the wheel of life and, and or the physical health, emotional health, relationships, financial, spiritual wellness, and we work with tools and techniques bringing that meditation and uh, working through the chakra system to release all the blockages through. So uh, that is, that's also on my website. Fantastic. And as always, we will put everything, all the links in the description to this episode. Final Thank question. You. If there was one take-home message that you would love everybody to remember from this conversation, what that would be? You are absolute infinite possibility. You have a magical being deep inside of you that has always been there. It is always you. But We've got this external mask on it. And I just hope I've planted the seeds of hope today for people to understand that they can step into their greatness and and live a life of, of joy, happiness, inner peace and infinite possibility and be anything that they absolutely want to be because your true self actually wants you to be that person. And there's little guidelines if there's guidance all the way. If you're listening to this today, that's your your internal guidance saying, listen to this. Um, you're getting a signal that you, you're getting closer to waking up. <laughs> Fantastic. That's so beautiful. Well, I hope that this episode has provided insight and inspirations on how we can change our life and activate our innate infinite potential. And I want to leave you with a quote from Bruce Lipton, who said, we are not victims of our genes, but masters of our destinies, able to create lives overflowing with peace, happiness, and love. Lisa, thank you so much for accepting our invitation for this lovely conversation. I really leaned in, <laughs> in, in the signs and I really loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And yes, we are the master of our destiny. So uh, thank you so much, Rosanna. And uh, thank you to all the listeners who've uh, who's listened to this. Fantastic. Well, we would love to know what you think about this topic. Are you already living at your full potential? If so, we would love to hear you about your journey. If you're not quite there, well, you are not alone. And surely there is plenty in this episode to get you started. But if you have any questions that perhaps we didn't address today, let us know, get in touch. We will strive to seek the answers you need. Also, don't forget to check Lisa's website to follow her on social media. You will find all the links in the description of today's episode. Hopefully not, but if you have been affected in any way by the topic we discussed today, as always, I invite you to seek professional help. Join me next time when we will continue exploring inspiring and challenging situations because remember, we are together in this journey. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy this content, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to hit the notification bell and like this video. See you in the next one.